In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've entered into that time of the church year where we focus on the end. And when we start to focus on the end, sometimes you start to read that gospel lesson and you almost, when, when you get the acclamation at the end, you almost want to add a question mark that says, this is the gospel of the Lord? Okay. And, and for two weeks in a row, we've kind of had one of the, a little bit of that and it's, it's only going to get worse next week. Come and see. Okay. All right, but, but for the last two weeks, the, Jesus and the Gospels have said some things that can make both pastor and people just a little nervous. You see, last week, Jesus started off his, his teaching with, these, with words of warning about the scribes and Pharisees who wear long robes and who seek the seat of honor and, 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 who, and who pray long prayers for a pretense. And I read that all the while, where wearing long robes and preaching a longish sermon. But lest you think that I'm the only one who should be nervous, today we hear Jesus saying something similar to you about putting your trust in magnificent structure. In, in, in the first century, it was putting the trust in the magnificent, beautiful stones of the temple. And we're reading that as we sit in this artistically and uh, 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 acoustically awesome building that you call St. Paul. Boy, the gospel's been hard on us recently. But there's a reason for that, because first, je je first century Jews and 21st century Lutherans share a common problem. You see, we're very good at putting our trust in buildings and efforts and accomplishments. And we do this at the expense of our trust in the only one who can deliver us, both body and soul, from the burden of sin and death and hell. Only Jesus' perfect and final work on the cross of Calvary, where he laid down his sinless life with sufficient suffering as that once-for-all payment for the debt of sin, only he can accomplish this deliverance. Now, now, we know this, but so often we look around at where we are and how we worship, and while we would never, ever think of it or ever speak it, secretly we're saying, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what magnificent buildings. And then Jesus responds. He puts the rest of this text in perspective for them and for us. Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And these words are not an idle threat. Just a couple of short decades after Jesus speaks these words, that magnificent structure that is the temple will be taken down stone by stone by the ravaging Romans. But that doesn't mean these words didn't sting. These words are an affront to the Jews of Jesus' day. In fact, if you recall, when we get to the Passion, this is going to be one of the charges that they lay against Him. When he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days, understand for Jesus to talk about taking down the temple, that's not just blasphemy. To a Jew, it's treason. But these words also apply not only to first century Jews. They hit us head on too. For how often do we rely on the edifices of our own making when we identify ourselves. When you're asked to identify yourself to someone new, how often do you define your identity by what you do? 
I'm a pastor. I'm a cop. I'm a businessman. We all do it. What happens, though, if we get laid off or fired or retire? Do you define yourself by your marital status or your parental status? What happens when your spouse dies or you're a victim of an unplanned divorce or your kids start to rebel and do all kinds of crazy things? Do we put our trust in a, the structures of our financial plan and our, and our retirement program? What happens when the market crashes? Oh, even in the congregation, we do this. We put trust in our pastors. We put trust in our leaders. We put trust in our strategic ministry plan. But what, what happens when the pastor takes a call or dies? What happens when the leaders don't live up to their trust? Or what happens when the strategic ministry plan turns out to be a great big old swing and a miss? We live this in our world, too. Over the last week and a half to two weeks, we have seen many of you experience a, a, a renewed confidence in the direction of our nation. Others think, what the heck are we doing? All because of how your candidate happened to fare. And yet in each one of these situations, what is revealed is that each, in each situation, our trust and our confidence is based in something that can and will change, and Jesus makes very clear, will be shaken and fall. So for this reason, Jesus gives us a stern but loving admonition. Be on your guard. Now, this has a double meaning for us, for it is connected to, the, it's connected to this truth that everything that we know and take for granted will be shaken the closer we get to the last day. And, and we see this playing out in our own day. You know, there are a lot of people here today who remember the day when the church was seen as an essential institution in the community and the world. A and the people that make up that church, they were seen as a valuable part of that same community. And yet in most places, that place of honor is gone. The church and those who make it up are, in a best-case scenario, viewed with indifference, and in a growing number of places, they are regarded as a threat. We've seen the court cases involving wedding photographers and bakers, and no political movement is going to end that. The worse. The shaking even gets close to home. Jesus says, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by, my, for, all, or by all for my name's sake. See, this is the problem. We make our Jesus way too shiny and our gospel way too sweet. We need to come to the grips with the reality that the true, unadulterated Word of God can and will cause divisions in homes. How many of you here today have children or nieces and nephews that haven't been to the Lord's house and to His table in you can't remember how long? Oh yeah, and what happens when you make that a topic of discussion at the Thanksgiving table? Worse yet, there are those we know and, and love in our very own families who've adopted lifestyles that violate God's Word and will, and they are entirely and defiantly unrepentant. And when we stand up for the clear Word of God, we learn one of those new, modern, newfangled terms, 
The kid looks at you and says, oh, you're such a hater. But it's not really new and fangled. Jesus told it was told us it was going to happen 2,000 years earlier. It's in the face of that, to you and to me, Jesus says, be on your guard. For you see, everything that Jesus has warned about in this text has happened, will happen, and will continue to happen until he returns. None of this should be unexpected. The world is going to respond to us like this. Our community is going to respond to us like this. Our homes are going to have these divisions. This battle is taking place against us and among us in so many fronts that it would very, be very easy for us to become terrified. And yet amid all of this warning comes a glorious promise. We don't face this battle alone. We will be equipped with the weapons and the strength that we need. Again, hear Jesus. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial, not if, when, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is not putting us on full alert and then saying, go fund for yourselves. Not in the least. That promised Holy Spirit, He'll be the one calling, gathering, enlightening, sanctifying, and keeping us all the while. So understand, we are on our guard when the Holy Spirit is doing the guarding. And he does that in word and sacrament. Daily time in God's word. That's all part of that armor of God that Paul talks to the Ephesians about in chapter 6. Weekly time. W-E-E-K-L-Y. Weekly time in the Lord's house hearing the words of absolution, hearing the word read and proclaimed, having the word placed into your mouth. That gives you the strength and establishes you for the battle that we will face, that we are facing. Jesus says, be on your guard. And then that guard is given to us freely, and repeatedly. And because of that, our confidence is not in structure or accomplishment. Our confidence is in the completed work of Jesus. He completed it at the cross. He completed it at you in your baptism where you were joined to His death, where you are guarded by His Word, where you are fed by His body and blood, and that guard will never let down no matter what the battle, even when the battle is death itself. Because you know you were baptized into His death. And because of that, you already are baptized into His resurrection. Across the desk from in my office at 8100 is a sign that was made by a wonderful gentleman who is 81 years old with macular degeneration, which sees the world through a straw, and he's a scroll saw master, and he has all ten of his fingers. And on that sign, it says a phrase that I often uttered when I taught the end times. I've read the book. I know how the story ends we win. That's the beautiful comfort we have. Because, and we need that ever-growing confidence in this guarding because we are facing an ever-growing uncertainty as the days roll by. Jesus says, many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when we hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. 
This must take place, but not the end. it's not the end yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. But these are the beginnings of the birth pains. These aren't even the real contractions. These are like theological Braxton Hicks things. Only the women are laughing at that. But we're experiencing this. We see the false teaching that is emanating from segments of the visible Christian church where that which is condemned as sin is being celebrated. And what falls victim is the gospel and those deceived by them. We look at the political and and, and military order of the world and we see turmoil. Today in our world, in our own nation, in our own community, there's going to be people who go to bed hungry And every one of these things tugs at our heartstrings and causes us to fear and leaves us susceptible to the deception of the father of lies. But we can take great comfort when we hear Jesus say, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. I need you to hear this not as a command, but as a promise. You see, He's already done everything needed. He's our guard. He's our guide. He's our God. He's the one who goes before us. He's the one who dwells and travels with us. He's got our back and our front and everything in between. And because of that, it's okay to wear long robes and preach long-ish sermons. It's okay to sing God's praises in architecturally and acoustically amazing buildings like this one because we're not talking about us. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking and singing about the one who guards and keeps. As a matter of fact, he's doing that right now. You need not fear. The Holy Spirit is at work in you and on you right now. He's building that trust in his word, that trust that you will need for today and tomorrow, and your last day, knowing that He is our guard through all our challenges, through death itself, all the way to eternity with Him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.